Hi, my name is uh, Rafael Yuste. I'm a professor of uh, biological sciences and neuroscience at Columbia University in New York. I'm also the director of the Neurotechnology Center that the university just created this last year. And I'm also co-director of the Catholic Institute of Brain Sciences at Columbia. So I sort of wear many hats, but essentially I, I'm a researcher that works in the lab 90% uh, of my time and teaches the other 10%. My passion in, in my career, my life, is to try to understand how the brain works. And within the brain, uh, we're particularly interested in the cerebral cortex of, of mammals. And the cortex is the largest part of our brain, and it's what makes us uh, human. So we know now for um, almost a century that uh, the cortex is the site of uh, a lot of what we call higher mental abilities that humans have. No? And the cortex is also the place that gets damaged or it's uh, malfunctioning in mental diseases and many neurological diseases. No? I got into the, into the field. I was originally trained as an MD in medicine. I still have a license in, uh, in Europe, although I don't practice. And then uh, I decided uh, that uh, it was a little bit hopeless to, treat, to try to treat uh, mental patients without understanding something more about how the brain works. And I came to, to this country, did a PhD in neuroscience, um, then started uh, working with optical methods in order to monitor the activity of many neurons at the same time. And then after that, uh, that PhD was at Rockefeller University in New York. And then uh, I did a, a postdoc, a four-year postdoc at Bell Labs, where I, I learned the other side of the, uh, of the, of the game with uh, the physicists, uh, people experts in optics and lasers, uh, that's where we did some of the first experiments using these femtosecond lasers, two photon lasers to image uh, neurons inside pieces of brain. And uh, after Bell Labs, I, I was hired at Columbia as an assistant professor, and I've been there for the last uh, 16 years. So in my career, I bring both the uh, biology medicine on one side and the biophysics, uh, optics, uh, technology on the other side, sort of I'm a, I could say, a switch hitter, <laughs> and, um, and that was also uh, probably important for the role that I, I ended up playing in the launching of the BRAIN initiative, because the BRAIN initiative, in a way, is sort of the merging of both uh, traditions. Now, it's trying to bring the physical scientists into neuroscience by building tools, particularly optical tools, in order to gather better information about how brains work in order to understand the brain and solve these diseases. So I think I've sort of uh, been lucky in my, in my life to be in the middle of this uh, merging of disciplines. We're interested in very basic questions about how the cortex works. And uh, from simple questions like how many classes of neurons are there in the cortex? How are they connected? What is it that they do when they talk to each other? What is the relation between their activity and the behavior of the animal? So that's the bread and butter of our work. Um, um, our laboratory is interdisciplinary, has people coming from different fields, from medicine, um, neuroscience, molecular biology, all the way to physics, chemistry, and computer science. Um, and uh, we try to work together as a team in some of these fundamental questions. And maybe one thing that distinguishes our work is that um, we've been very uh, keen from the beginning in using optical methods to approach these questions, uh, and in particular using two photon uh, lasers, two photon microscopy. So these femtosecond lasers have uh, in our hands uh, great uh, advantages for imaging and controlling brain activity in, in animals. So a lot of what we do has to do with two-photon imaging, two-photon uh, uh, manipulation, optogenetics. We're very interested in something that we've discovered, which is that these brain circuits, we study mostly mice, the visual cortex of mice, and uh, we find that they have a lot of spontaneous activity in the visual cortex, even if they're not looking at, a, at the visual scene, even in the dark, or when they're looking at the blank screen, the neurons are just far and away very pretty much uh, as much as when the animal is actually looking at something. So this spontaneous activity is incidentally, it's not the first time that scientists uh, describe this. Uh, this was found, uh, the very early uh, hints that something like this was going on happened almost a hundred years ago when 
the first development of the EEG. Uh, Hans Berger uh, put it on his uh, occipital uh, skull in the visual area and he noticed how he had a lot of waves and activity when his eyes were open, but when he closed he still had a lot of waves and activity. So there was something already there. And uh, this spontaneous activity is prevalent throughout the brain in all animals. So it's not something weird that happens only in the visual cortex of mice. No, it happens everywhere. In fact, in humans, it's been recently reported using uh, fMRI that there's this default uh, network, they call it, this sort of spontaneous activity that goes on in the patients that no one knows what, what it's good for. So we're, we're very interested in, in pursuing that spontaneous activity. We hope they will give us some secret of what the circuits in the, in the cortex or in the brain are are doing. I was trained as an MD and I remember uh, uh, doing the rotation in the psychiatry wards in Madrid. I come from Spain and uh, we had to, to treat uh, sort of uh, work with uh, paranoid schizophrenics uh, and these were uh, institutionalized. They were in essentially in a, in a jail behind bars because they're dangerous uh, and uh, we had to interview them with a bodyguard. And I remember these interviews because these are some of the smartest people I've ever met. These were, some people were really smart. Yet, they had something in there that was crooked or, or, or just switched in the wrong way. You know? So instead of being fantastic uh, contributors to society, they leave a devastating trail of uh, destruction and, and, uh, and uh, pain in their lives you know, around all of them. So I, I, I had the feeling that with what we knew about Neuroscience, we're not going to solve schizophrenia. And this is just a, it's a little bit like trying to, to fix a machine if you don't know how it works. So, so at that point I said, you know what, maybe I should just, instead of continuing in medicine, I should look into helping from the other side, just from the basic science, neuroscience. And at that point, uh, I decided to come to the US for a PhD because I thought I needed more training. So I was lucky that I was accepted in this lab where uh, um, it was a very creative group of people in the WISA lab at Rockefeller. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, and one of the projects that uh, I started working on is trying to, to see if we could measure the activity of more than one neuron for this reason I, I told you earlier, to see if we can see a little bit bigger pieces of the screen. Huh? And I started uh, playing really with uh, calcium indicators who had just been developed for biochemical measurements in, in cells and discovered by chance that, that you could use them to measure the activity of neurons. So I still remember the day that that happened and my, the face of my advisor when I showed him the data. And, uh, and at that point I was completely hooked. I thought this is it, I'm just doing this uh, uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, and, uh, and after that I was invited to, to do a postdoc at Bell Labs because the group at Bell Labs who were very strong in optics and they were interested also in brain circuits they understood the power of using these methods to measure activity. And um, yeah, I, I think I've been uh, sort of on that track of using optical methods to measure brain activity just for a long time, now for 26 years now.